I sometimes feel like people are too nervous about losing money that if you buy 10 of these things with operational gearing and a couple of them go wrong, but five or six of them go right and two of them do nothing, you're probably going to double, treble, quadruple your money, even though the two ones that have gone wrong are down 50% or down 80%. The upside is great enough for you not to worry about that. I guess that's my risk tolerance and I can see that maybe it's not for everyone. Yeah, I like companies that have high gross margins and low net margins. I think that's one of the things that came out of the 100 Baggers book, which looks for its extreme upside companies. And that was one of the things is because that's giving you the operational gearing. So because they've got low EBIT margins, their administrative costs, their fixed costs are relatively high. But actually, if they deliver the revenue growth, then suddenly the shape of the P&L changes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. If people are fans of screening for that sort of company, that's what I like to look for, for that sort of thing, yeah. which is a little little bit counterintuitive. You think, oh, quality companies want high gross margin, high net margin. But actually, if you're looking for this operational gearing, and I wonder whether some of these software companies are actually there at the moment. It's an interesting idea. I quite like high return on capital companies where the revenue has started going backwards on the basis that eventually the revenue growth will recover. But of course, <laughs> it can be wrong and the, the revenue growth doesn't come back and then they just look very ordinary companies. Yeah. In today's episode, we talk about TPI cap, some of the psychological biases we have, how much research you should do before investing in a company. We look at companies that are trading at or below cash and the sort of characteristics we look in those sort of companies. Plus we go through our thoughts on the computer game industry. Hey Bruce, how's it going? Afternoon. Very happy with my Burford um, shareholding on Friday afternoon. Doing particularly well. It's probably an interesting thing to start with, actually. I tend to have a, a fairly diversified portfolio in terms of different risks. So, you know, I'll have some oil companies, I'll have some gold miners, I'll have some kind of trading businesses in the UK, some trading businesses, usually UK listed, but with kind of international exposure. And I find there's a sort of psychological crutch here, I find. The day that the markets go down and you see your more mid cap type stocks go down, that high risk gold miner tends to go up and not exclusively but uh, having that uncorrelated risk in there is actually a psychological crutch that means you know you don't just watch all your shares go down continuously for a couple of months and, <laughs> and i think this is one of the attractions of burford isn't it that's actually uncorrelated to other things Yes, although during the pandemic, it sold off from about £20 down to about £3.50. So the story about uncorrelated risk didn't work quite so well. I have quite a diversified portfolio, but last year I found that I was down about 30% over 12 months. And just at one point, everything went down. Do you think that's your style? Because obviously you're more of a long-term quality investor. Do you think there was a, an aspect of style in that, that just all sorts of yeah, quality because... went down? Could be because I tend not to rebalance. So that does mean that my larger positions tend to be high quality stocks that have grown and grown over five, 10 years. And that does mean that they're quite vulnerable to top slicing. I've grown to live with it. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's a, a sort of idea in the market that you should obviously go for the, the highest sharp ratio. And this idea that if you can reduce your volatility, then you can gear up and get the same return for lower risk and lower volatility. And it, it works really well in practice, but do you know anybody who actually gears up a portfolio intentionally? You know, on those really bad days, you can get everything selling off. So being geared just doesn't work. It's worth going for the highest returns that you can yeah. with the caveat that you can accept the downside volatility and obviously yeah. for that style, for the higher returns it generates over the very long term, you can cope with that sort of volatility. I do sometimes wonder about the guys who hold three or four major stocks and they're down 50%, you know, sometimes 70% it, the depths of the crash in 2020. It's just, I'm not sure I could yeah, cope that with that level of downside volatility. Yeah, there were a lot of people who owned gold during the financial crisis on the basis that they thought that the banks were in trouble. Their conclusion was to buy gold, which didn't actually work as a hedge because then gold collapsed. And I think gold collapsed because this forced selling that hedge funds started seeing redemptions in the second half of 2008. That just meant that everything went down. And even if you'd been on the right side of things, people were asking for their money back and you had to sell the most liquid things that you could. And gold was one of those things. 
So there's certain times where, you know, liquidity just gets sucked out of the market. And I think sort of 2020, it was these risk parity funds blowing up. It's a kind of theory that you can do better than your kind of typical 60, 40 portfolio by gearing the portfolio and investing in proportion in bonds or proportion in stocks based on their relative volatilities. And of course it makes a lot of sense, but you add the gearing in there and everyone's blowing up. And you also, I think, got what they call the quant quake where everybody was long value momentum and quality. And once they start to go wrong, probably with leverage as well, everybody was selling the same thing. And I think you get some real bargains when you get these liquidity style events, which as kind of brings- As long as you're on the right side of it. Yes, as long as you've got some cash to deploy. I find is that at the moment I want to be fully invested because I'm looking at the cash adjusted PE ratio of my portfolio at the moment is something like four or five across 25 different stocks in different industries. I struggle to be bearish. I struggle to be somebody who is selling these things on such this valuation, but then we have had some worries in the market. On the one hand, people have said, well, there are these problems emerging of the banks like Credit Suisse and Silicon Valley Bank. The Federal Reserve and the central banks are going to pause for breath and they're no longer going to be raising interest rates. But on the other hand, there's been money leaving the financial system from the banks. The Fed actually produces a, a weekly balance sheet of the commercial banks in the US. In the middle of March, there was 175 billion leaving commercial banks to go into money market funds. That's now dropped the most recent week with recording this at the beginning of April. So the last week of March, that dropped to 125 billion. And the context, there's 17 trillion of deposits in US banks, customer deposits. And so you might think 125 billion, that's not very much compared to 17 trillion. But the trouble is if you analyze that figure, if you multiply it by 52, then you get 6 trillion, which would obviously be a bit of a problem for the system because then what happens is that these banks are going to be cutting in their lending and then that's going to reduce money supply to the economy. So there are two, these two contrasting things going on and it's quite difficult to analyze. It's a funny idea to say, well, you should be selling shares and going into cash because you think the market's going to go down because money supply is going to go down. Because if you're selling equities to go into cash, then you're actually putting money back into the banking system. Yes. It's <laughs> a bit of those a, a Excel weird thing. spreadsheet circular references. Yeah. Head explodes. Yes, I'm not going to be putting 6 billion in a day. So that's not going to balance it out. But yes. yeah, I get the problem with that kind of US banking sector and potentially, but I struggle to see that kind of real crisis occurring that's going to affect a UK listed small cap. One of the things I think that's been lost a bit in the debate is people talk a lot about interest rates, but actually inflation is still double digit rates. OPEC cut oil production, so oil looks like it's going to stay high. So it's actually actually inflation that erodes the value of long dated fixed income assets, not interest rates. These central banks, they might cut interest rates, but actually I can't see people sticking with money in the bank earning 0.5% if inflation remains high. People are going to put that money to work and they're either going to put it to work in the market or they're going to spend it. I'm thinking of having some work done on my house just because I feel like my money's sitting there in the bank and the inflation's high. It's normally a good time to do work on your house when there's a recession going on because you can actually get a builder. <laughs> You're in, in Germany, right? Yes. Sure you have to build your own house. That's the, uh, that's the German culture, isn't it? That is the German culture. They, uh, they do like to build their own houses. Yeah. Sticking with financials, should we talk about TP ICAP? Yeah, yeah. Bit of background. This is a stock that Bruce presented on a mellow when I was on the bash panel as well. And I've got to say, I, I owe you a beer for this one because I bought it with very little research and it was about my best performer in 2022. I have to say, I was pretty nervous about buying that because in one sense, value investing is easy. You buy stocks on six times earnings on a high dividend yield. Of, I can't remember what the dividend yield was, 7%, 8% then you wait for them to go up to 12 times earnings and the dividend yield to fall. But very often these stocks that are really lowly rated, the market's saying those EPS forecasts that are out in the market, you've missed something. There's something wrong. As an example, Northern Rock used to grow at 20% a year, it had a 20% return on equity. You know, it was on 10 times PE ratio. 
you think maybe ROE could fall to, from 20% to 15% or maybe growth could slow from 20% to, I don't know, 12%. But I can't see what's going to sink this. Of course, something came out from completely left field, which was the, the wholesale funding. Suddenly it's like, ah, oh, that's why this was trading on 10 times earnings. And I have to say, I had a similar feeling with TPI cap that I thought this looks too cheap, but I must be missing something. I understand the bear case that there's been a flow of trading away from over the counter OTC to exchanges because the regulator wants to encourage more trading on exchanges. But I think they've got a pretty flexible cost base. The cost base is basically people. Yeah. So just a step back, they're a, they're an inter-dealer broker, aren't they? Yes. So do you want to explain a bit about what that actually is? Cause I'm not yeah. sure. I really fully understand that even. Essentially, if, if banks have debt or, or derivative or something they want to sell, but they want to remain anonymous, Royal Bank of Scotland doesn't want to phone up Goldman Sachs and say, hey, we've got a bunch of bonds that we want to sell because the, the anonymity of the buyer is valuable. So they have this intermediary in between them that arrange the deals. And a lot of what interdealer brokers do is that they go out and they socialize and do a lot of face-to-face -face work in the evenings, chatting, driving out business, finding out gossip. And the regulator hates it because it's none of it's on recorded phone lines. It's how broken used to be. They then got on the phone the next morning and say, oh, what about doing this bit of business? Or what about, I've got this risk or I want to lay this. And so a lot of their trades are multi-legged as well, that they maybe got an oil company somewhere and a bank somewhere else, and they want to hedge out different risks. And they put these guys together. The balance sheet is slightly bizarre because although they're pretty close to net cash or single digits net debt, but they've got a very large gross cash position and then a very large gross debt position. And they tend and to- is, is that partly regulated? capital. I think if, even if it's not regulatory capital, a little bit like these brokers like Argentex and Alpha Group and Equals, they need that cash there just to do the business. A little bit in the way that a lawyer with an escrow account that you need to know that intermediary is not going to fail. I'm not sure if it's regulatory or if it's just that the market polices it anyway. Yeah, it makes sense, but it's, it's not necessarily capital that can just be returned yeah. to shareholders tomorrow and the business carry on as it was. I think there's, exactly. yeah, many of these kind of transactional businesses have the same style or the same characteristics, don't they? Yeah. Um, I had a mate who, he worked in FX options at an investment bank and he traded a lot with these guys. I sent him a message saying, I caps on six times earnings. What do you think? What's the risk? And he went, oh yes, I, I know someone who used to be very senior there. I'll ask him and came back and just said, he reckons there's a problem with the principal agent which I had no idea what it meant. <laughs> I think he meant that the staff capture most of the rewards rather than the shareholders. But I think that was about when the price was £1.20 and it's now closer to £2. So trying to do this background research with industry contracts sometimes mm -hmm. backfires. And I also had a mate who used to work in HBOS Treasury and he was convinced that HBOS wasn't going bust in 2008. So it's, <laughs> you have to be careful who you talk to. It's one of those challenges of almost being too close to a company. I think sometimes when people have very specific industry knowledge, it can be a competitive advantage, but it can also be that never invest there because I know the CEO is an idiot or they know there's been a botched transaction mm. to purchase a, another company. And you probably know from the companies you work for, you know, all the dirty laundry, but often those things don't matter to the big picture. Yeah. A strong business can, can often continue with a terrible CEO for a long time and be successful. So how do you balance that? Did you think there's a limit to how much research you do or can do? I feel like it's particularly difficult with financials because people who work in financials tend to be financially literate and yet they still get their own companies that they work out completely wrong. I suppose what it was telling me actually was I tried to do some research by asking in industry insiders. And really what came back was nothing that was particularly insightful. Whereas if they'd said, oh yeah, actually there's a big black hole in the balance sheet or the regulator regulations are going to change and no one's realized it, then I'm saying, ah, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's something that I had spotted. Mm. Whereas yeah. the sort of the idea that in financial organizations that the, the staff are taking all the bonuses and the rewards and the, leaving the liabilities of the shareholders. I don't mean that's particularly controversial, but it's not <laughs> a particularly original thought either. So what do you think kind of DI cap going forward? Do you think these results show it there's still upside there? Cause it still looks on a very reasonable rating. Yeah. I think it's an interesting story. One of the things is 
what happened in the nickel market with the London Metals Exchange, I think has made people rethink a little bit whether everything should be on exchange. Just for context, what happened is that this Chinese company was short a particular nickel contract. They were producing nickel, but it wasn't the same as the standardized contract. And so they got into all sorts of trouble and there was a big short squeeze. And the London Metal Exchange effectively then cancelled that and said, well, that's, although that's the market price, we don't think it's the market price. And there are court cases going on, probably Burford or sort of some other litigation funder is funding them. But the idea that everything can trade on an exchange is probably flawed because you need standardised contracts for things to trade on exchange. And a lot of these commodities don't have standardised contracts. So I think there's always going to be a need for interdealer brokers and OTC trading. And that's 60% of revenue and that being slack for the last four years. So it's not a great story, but the low multiples telling you that that's already in the price. And there are a couple of other businesses. They bought Liquidet, which is an equities exchange, which hasn't been a particularly impressive acquisition. They bought it at the top of the market and it's been disappointing. Then they've also got something called Parmita Solutions, which originally they said it's core to the business because they use the analogy of it's like the exhaust pipe. It takes the data from the OTC markets that ICAP operates in and uses that data. And then that's very high margin. So that there is a synergy there. Almost reminded me of Tesco's and Dunhumby that Tesco said, oh, we have this data analysis business called Dunhumby and it uses all the loyalty card data. But it turned out that actually that wasn't particularly valuable if you sold it to anyone else because it needed all the Tesco's data in order for it to be valuable. The lots of businesses seem to think data is their commodity, almost like all the value is in their data. You need a customer, you need somebody who's willing to pay for that. I feel like it's a little game that companies play as well, trying to convince everyone that they're a technology platform. We are a platform this or a platform that. And they think, oh, suddenly if we call ourselves a platform, we'll trade on 30 times earnings rather than 10 times earnings. Mm. Sometimes it's true. Very often it's something that financial PRs have figured out. And also that thing of can the business stand on its own as a kind of standalone data driven business. The one that comes to mind is a system one Have you. Yeah come across that and it had a kind of core marketing business based on the Danny Kahneman kind of system one, system two ideas. And it was used to be called brain juicer as well, didn't it? Yes. And it seemed quite a nice kind of marketing business, but has gone through some real tough times of the kind of core business declining. Yet they've got this data business inside that seems to be growing, but nowhere near fast enough to overcome the, the decline of the rest yeah, of the I, business. And it's also worth bearing in mind Dunhumby, this valuable bit of Tesco's. If Dunhumby was so great, you would expect Tesco's EBIT margin to be better than 3%. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's it. It's a good point. If the value's there and more nefarious actors have known to play around with the pricing sometimes on these things of sort of take one service, if you add in the data service as well, and, and overall it ends up being cheaper than the competitor, but the way they kind of mark the revenue between the two streams looks like you've got this incredible software business. Because and... management know that investors will pay for a sexy data business and a boring supermarket business. Yeah. So yeah. that's a little bit of that is on with the transfer pricing that you allocate the cost to the business investors aren't giving much value to anyway. So yes, I agree. That also is mm. tends to happen. Shall we talk about other software companies then? You spotted that quite a few kind of computer game companies were reporting or had interesting news. And it, it's a sector that a lot of kind of quality invest as a value investor, I've never really got comfortable with. So do you want to give a bit of, sort of background first of what's attractive, what you find attractive about the sector? We've had Tiny Build, Keyword Studios and Team 17 reporting this week. I own Frontier Developments. I think this is an example of a sector where through the cycle, you get high returns on capital, but it is very hit or miss. So you have good years and bad years. And in the good years, these things look fantastic. They have high margins and high growth. And in bad years, they have terrible margins, if not loss making and no growth. What the market tends to do is when they have a good year, which was the pandemic, the market then tends to put that 
high margin, high growth on a high multiple, which is extrapolating in something to be ridiculously expensive. And then what investors then do is when it all goes wrong, the share price drops 80% because the margins and the growth look terrible. And that is basically what we've got at the moment. So frontier developments down from about four pounds 50 down from 34 pounds, tiny build IPO about two years ago, that's down 80%. Team 17 has done slightly better. It's only down 55, 0% from its peak. So I feel like actually as a value investor on traditional measures like PE, yeah, they still look expensive. They look like they're on, I don't know, 50 times earnings or something. Yeah. But we that you say that, what... but tiny build actually comes in fairly cheaply if you believe their forecasts. It's a sort of six, like nine forward, yeah. kind of six or seven business, but potentially the lowest quality of them, of all of them. Yeah. And the other difficult thing is that they've all, tiny builds grown by acquisitions, Keyword Studios grown by acquisitions, and also Team 17 last year bought three companies. So it's very hard to know how these acquisitions are doing. One thing Tiny Build say is that 80% of their revenue is from previous years. So what happens is you produce a game and then there's a long tail of revenue that comes from that. They also can sell updates on that game or sell player downloadable content is what it's called. And so this isn't that they need to have a hit every year. It's just if they have a couple of years of missing, then suddenly this, these companies don't look so clever after all. But I think as a value investor, I would try and convince you to broaden your definition of what a value investor is. And as Andrew Sykes, which grows at, I don't know, five, 10% a year, has a high return on capital and it's easy to value, easy to predict, very sensible business. Nothing against Andrew Sykes, but something like Frontier Development, best year revenue was up 160% and its worst year <laughs> revenue was down 20%. So in 2024, it's full cost to grow at 8%. I nearly asked ChatGPT to try and build me a Monte Carlo valuation simulation with just putting in a range of estimates rather than a point estimate. Your central scenario might be that it grows at 8%. There'll probably be quite wide variety of outcomes with all of these computer game companies. I wondered why people don't use Monte Carlo simulations more for equity valuation. The thought occurred to me, actually, I know why. It's probably because you stick in your assumptions and the answer comes out the share price is worth between 30 pence and one pound 40. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's just a game. That range is so wild that I can't actually do anything with it. Yes. Yeah. And of course it misses any black swans or anything out in there that's not in your assumption set. The, yeah. the challenge is that the, the inputs tend to be wider than you can ever imagine. So it's the classic thing of you, you ask people to give the population of Denver, give me your 95% confidence intervals on this. And of course they go for much more narrow. You'd expect that if that happens, 95% of their things which will range would fall within there, but actually people don't give their confidence intervals are anywhere near wide enough. So your model might say 30p to £1.40, but what can be useful, I think, is it can show you which of the inputs of the real yeah. drivers, and then it gives you the impetus to narrow down onto those inputs. Yeah, I think you're right. It's surprising that people don't do Monte Carlo analyses on equity investments because there's a lot of probabilistic thinking in there. Absolutely. Generally, I think as retail investors, what we should be doing is looking for companies with operational gearing. The one one thing that's very hard to predict is revenue growth, but what you want to own is companies where if there is revenue growth, it drops through to the bottom line. And there are a lot of businesses, which are the opposite, where they're reporting high levels of growth, but you never see any profitability. And I quite like the idea of looking for companies that don't own this, but I would give it an example as best of the best, which when the revenue comes through, it drops through to the bottom line. And it's a double-edged sword because when the revenue drops away, as it did after the pandemic, then that also drops straight through to the bottom <laughs> line and profits are much more sensitive to that yeah. change in revenue. And also you, you have to be fairly confident that the moat is there on those sort of things as well. I think if, because otherwise those sales can just keep dropping, you know, something that has that operational gearing, it's very powerful on the downside. You know, if somebody comes along, the competitors come along and eaten your lunch, as it were, it's, you've got a long way down. 
I sometimes feel like people are too nervous about losing money that if you buy 10 of these things with operational gearing and a couple of them go wrong, but five or six of them go right and two of them do nothing, then you're probably going to double, treble, quadruple your money, even though the two ones that have gone wrong are down 50% or down 80%. The upside is great enough for you not to worry about that. I guess that's my risk tolerance and I can see that maybe is not for everyone. Yeah, I like companies that have high gross margins and low net margins. I think that's one of the things that came out of the 100 Baggers book, which looks for its extreme upside companies. And that was one of the things is because that's giving you the operational gearing. So because they've got low EBIT margins, their administrative costs, their fixed costs are relatively high. But actually, if they deliver the revenue growth, then suddenly the shape of the P&L changes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If people are fans of screening for that sort of company, that's what I like to look for, for that sort of thing, yeah. which is a little bit counterintuitive. You think, oh, quality companies want high gross margin, high net margin. But actually, if you're looking for this operational gearing, and I wonder whether some of these software companies are actually there at the moment. It's an interesting idea. I think quite like high return on capital companies where the revenue has started going backwards on the basis that eventually the revenue growth will recover. But of course, <laughs> you can be wrong and the, the revenue growth doesn't come back and then they just look very ordinary companies. Yeah. Yeah. When I was looking at these sort of companies, I was surprised how good was Lucico or Lukaku, uh, I'm not yes. quite how it's pronounced, yeah. but this is a company that produces electrical socket and these kind of things. So at best it's a sort of... Yeah, accessories. Best it's a, it's an operational moat. It's, it's a branding in there, but really it's because they produce these things more efficiently and design them better than their competitors. But I was surprised how good a business it was in terms of having a reasonable gross margin for its sector and this potential for operational gearing and high cash flow. It was a surprise to me that this was coming out as one of my top companies on these sort of metrics. You just wouldn't think that was that sort of company. And I think the story is very different to the reality. So I'm not a big fan of something, yeah. for example, Beaks a financial cloud because it just seems to take all of its cash and reinvest it. So it's growing, it's great, but it takes so much, it always seems to take so much capital to generate that growth. Yeah, it doesn't seem a quality business to me. It doesn't seem to have back to those sort of companies where the real attraction is that they're putting the capital in on behalf of the customer rather than, you know, in terms of for a license fee, rather than the customer valuing its technological advantage and its data advantage. So did you buy Lucio? Yes, I did. That was one of the outcomes of looking into these sort of stocks. As a several others that looked good, but I couldn't get comfortable with the multiple. Something like Focus, again, has historically been a very strong compounder. But both these companies come from acquisition. It, the real growth is acquiring companies and the network then of sales, like using the sales teams to push the products that they've kind of purchased. You know, the difference was that Lucico at the time when I bought seemed pretty cheap, whereas Focus still seemed a little expensive. Yeah, I wonder I whether think, it's a bias. Yeah, it might yeah, be a bias. Well, I've noticed that the market rates acquisitions with organic growth, and that might be the result of previous year's acquisitions. Something like Keyword Studios reported organic growth of 22%, including acquisitions, something like 35%. But something like Team 17, the organic growth had fallen to 3%. All the growth is coming from acquisitions. And I feel like investors can buy companies. Companies can buy companies. Why are you yeah. paying company management to buy companies if they can't grow their own yeah. top line? And yeah, Barney Bill doesn't even reveal what their organic growth rate is. But so I suspect it's not very impressive. Particularly when very much stated there's not really any synergy. For example, you've got companies like Judges Scientific or SDI. They've been very successful, almost not build, just yeah. buy centralized some admin functions probably, but they very much leave the businesses to themselves, maybe a bit of cross-selling, but have been very successful for investors. I've often felt that kind of model was a bit of alchemy, but all they're really doing is arbing the private multiple that you pay with the public multiple that investors pay for the, for the listed company. But at the end of the day, it's worked. <laughs> I know. It's, I'm sure I held some judges at, you know, a really oh, no. valuation at some point and sold them. <laughs> they look, look more expensive. I was listening to David Einhorn talking about how he sold Apple when it was at cash value. <laughs> or he bought it at cash and it went up 40% and then he sold. Yeah. I suppose it's, a, it's an observation that your worst mistakes are not the ones that you buy and they go down. It's the ones that you sell and they go up for a reason you don't understand and you sell after you've made 50% and then you come back five years later and discover they're a five or a 10 bagger. 
That's yeah. very frustrating. Yeah, that, that's yeah, Keyword definitely. Studios for me. Right, yes. <laughs> that's that's on there. I think in Tiny Build, there was some concerns over them changing their depreciation policy or their amortization. Did you clock that? I, I think they've so. extended their time. Now, this might be because the games are selling longer, but equally, it can be a red flag where they're struggling with earnings. And Yeah, I think the first thing to say as well, that you have to question why anyone would list on AIM when you have a headquarters in the US, because... At Seymour Pierce, we had a rule that we were very cautious of Israeli and US companies that wanted to come to AIM. Not because we were prejudiced against Americans or Israeli people, but because both those countries have proper stock markets and financially sophisticated investors. So why are you coming to AIM? Whereas if it was a headquarters in Lithuania or Georgia or somewhere, you go, okay, this country doesn't have a well-developed stock market, so you can see why you've come to AIM. So I think there's something there that the U.S. investors might not have liked. And software companies, games companies in, in the U.S., people know how to value them. People are familiar with the models. I don't know why it is, but that was something that instantly put me on my guard. The shares are now down 80% and I think it could be worth looking at. Yeah, potentially these things can be in the price effectively. Even if you uh, put that am amortization back at historic rates, then it might still look cheap in this case, I think. My observation with games companies is if you consider TPI cap has the problem that all the staff take the benefits, I think the games companies actually have the opposite as a benefit because often people want to work for games companies for the prestige because they like games. It's like if you're an engineer, people like to work for Formula what One. What are you saying about like... financial services? <laughs> <laughs> if you like spreadsheets like us, you want to work for financial <laughs> services, but yeah, we still want to be paid. A friend who worked for one of the bigger games companies he moved for you know no salary increase effectively because he wanted to work on games and if they gave him the job of optimizing loading times or something like that so he ended up doing kind of quite boring yeah, jobs I, see. I hadn't thought about there are a few industries like that pr is one that i feel like people in pr a lot of people are underpaid because there's a lot of socializing <laughs> yeah. yeah but and film i have friends who work can film and I feel like they don't earn much money. I think if you get completely underpaid in these industries, people do move, but it shows that the intrinsic motivation of working so on something interesting is actually the pull than necessarily the pay packet. And this particular friend got headhunted by Apple to work on some of those things. And again, he thought, oh, this is a kind of really interesting opportunity. And obviously because they're headhunting, they paid him more, but then they gave him boring jobs to do. So he left. So it's, you can work some of the greatest software companies in the world, but if the main thing they want you to do is uh, is optimizing loading times, it might not be the, it might, yeah, <laughs> you might not last long. But a lot of people stick with these companies, work for these companies because they enjoy what they the do. Prestige of saying yeah. I work for Apple. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, that is a, not a strong moat, but that is a, a potential source of, of excess earnings for these sort of businesses. Should we do the last topic we'd considered, which was, you know, some companies at the moment seem to be trading at cash or below cash. Do you had one that you'd picked <laughs> out, haven't you? So this, this is not my greatest investment. This is Smooth, which used to be ULS technology. The history of this is November 2020, they sold a business called Conveyancing Alliance Limited, Cal, for 28 million. So they had this cash on their balance sheet. I was like, oh, this should be defensive. They've got half the market cap is cash. Anyway, they've had a couple of profit warnings and it's now trading at cash. It's literally, it's cash value. So you could say they should just liquidate the company and return that cash to shareholders, but they're not going to do that. They're going to carry on for a couple of years. They can afford to make, be loss making and they are trying to disrupt the mortgage market with a conveyancing solution, which is a great idea in theory, but it's trading on one times revenue. It's trading on cash. And I looked at just an example, Domino's Pizza Poland, which has been listed for 15 years. Seymour Pierce listed this. <laughs> it's never made a profit. Maybe it will come good one day. But even that is trading on two times revenue. And so I look at this and go, wow, whoever's selling, this makes me really nervous. Whoever's selling this. <laughs> What do they know that I don't know? It's the cash burn that's put me off. It's like you look at those forecasts and they're saying they're going to lose another 6 million this year yeah. and another 4 million the year after with only slight revenue growth. So I can't see a path. They don't at least exhaust all of this cash and maybe at the end they have a valuable business in there, but I'm not really able to value this business. I wouldn't want to invest 
even though, like you say, it's not quite below net cash, according to my figures here at the moment. But that might well, be... Well, cash keeps going down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. keeps going down. There's a couple like this that also stand out. The other one that stands out to me is Brand Architects. Have you come across that one? They're like a Crichton's or a skincare, beauty, that kind of thing. They... And they sold something as well, didn't they? Yeah, they sold their manufacturing division for, again, about, well, off the top of my head, maybe 30 million or a reasonable amount of cash. And then they're investing it into the brand side of it. So they were saying, well, we can do contract manufacturing. That's what Crichton's and some of the bigger players do is they'll do at least some contract manufacturing. So there we can get our brands contract manufactured. We can sell the, the actual manufacturing part and focus on potentially the high margin aspect of brands. The problem is, I think the, do they actually have strong brands? And if you're going to buy them, are you getting a good deal? So you yeah, get to. Uh, this is what banks tend to do is they tend to sell the valuable businesses. Barclays sold BGI in 2009. That's now gone on to be more valuable than Barclays. And yeah, so you sometimes wonder if maybe Smoothie and Brand Architects have sold the wrong business. They should have yeah. to contract manufacturing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and again, another one, I think the forecast I'm looking here is saying they're potentially going to break even in 2024, but given the kind of history of losses since they divested this or sold off the manufacturing part of the business, I wouldn't put a lot of trust in that. They've gone from about 19 million of cash down to 8 million at the last half year. So again, another one potentially that's going to run out, at least going to run down that cash before they're profitable. And, you know, I'm not sure I can value the ongoing business, so I wouldn't want to owe. Smooth has been, as ULS Technologies, has been around for 20 years and was profitable and successful. And Brand Architects, I would imagine, it was profitable. And yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you have these situations where there have obviously been strategic choices made that don't look so wise at the moment. But maybe they'll come good. They're probably the only sort of companies that are trading very close to cash are where there's clear commitment to use the cash. But there's an easy route to profitability. So something like Angling Direct is a company I hold. And depending on what price you take, it's got quite a big spread. You could easily say you're only paying sort of 5 million or something for the business, maybe seven or eight, depending on what the share price is on the day. You know, and this has got 60, 70, 80% of the share price in cash. It's kind of money they've both raised and generated internally, and they are using it to open stores. They've opened a number of stores and it's a kind of retail rollout that's going through some difficult times, not least because of weather conditions and various external things that they can't control, but they know what the rent is on a store. They know how much stock they have to put in and they know roughly what the sales are going to be. And they have a model that says, this is a good use of that cash and that will over the cycle will yeah, generate so, this sort of return. So I feel like that's an example of when you're deploying capital, you actually have some fairly clear cut parameters and you can see when your assumptions are wrong. With a software business, you put money into developing the software and then maybe the software isn't good or maybe it's just for no fault of your own that the convincing lawyers are not happy using workflow management software because they're, they're all quite conservatives and they don't want to use the technology to help them improve the process. With software businesses, you spend the money, you just don't know if it's going to be successful or not. Which is why something like the games companies where they have a proven track record of generating these titles over a number of years, some are hits, some are not, it is probably a better bet than something like Smooth, in my mind. But Well, we will see how it goes. But there's all very well being a value investor or being a quality investor, but when something's that cheap, you don't really want to cut your losses when it's trading <laughs> cash. That's it's particularly painful. Yeah, yeah. I think that probably the key with something like this is don't average down. If you did do your Monte Carlo analysis and came with a valuation somewhere between zero and wherever the upside is, it's well, like... It was a, one pound fifty a couple of years ago. So. Yes. You don't want to keep averaging down on this sort of stock because you know that potential floor of that thing that people are looking at is cash level. That's going to keep going down. So the downside keeps going down, but the that upside might remain and might be a good bet yeah, in the end. I mean, the, the only thing I think about that is that the mortgage market this year is going to be very difficult. I think transaction volumes are down 30, 40% for home buying already. And it did strike me that actually maybe you want to own the business which has a lot of cash, which can get through the next couple of years rather than anyone else who's competing against mm. it, which who might yeah. decide that now's the time to leave the industry. That was a problem with the COVID is I bought a lot of stuff that had cash. And then of course, COVID loans and bounce back loans were all available. And actually 
if you were the company that prepared for it and sat in cash, you were sort of the chump at the end of the day. But that's how it turned out was a lot of the weakest companies survived by taking on COVID loans and the more prescient ones were actually punished for not running to the wire. So investing is hard. It is, yes. You can't foresee everything. And on that note, should we wrap it up? And on that bombshell. (laughs) (laughs) On that bombshell, investing is hard. Yeah, yeah. If you don't take anything from this podcast, take away, investing is hard. That's it for another episode of the Value Trap Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you like this conversation, then please subscribe. And don't forget to check out our partner podcast shows, the Fund Your Retirement Podcast, and also the Private Investors Podcasts, hosted by Maynard Patton and Roland Head, where they discuss individual companies. The links are just below in our bio, along with our Twitter handles. See you in the next episode, and bye for now.